Hey, we're in a series called One Another, and we've been going through that, and uh, we're on number nine tonight as we're going through our One Another series on building relationships one with another and how we work on that and do that. And then we come to one tonight entitled Edify One Another. If there's anything anyone in here needs is building up. Every person in here tonight needs to be built up, encouraged, edified. And that's what we've been instructed to do in the Word of God. And we're going to go to the masterpiece, as far as I'm concerned, in the New Testament. And that is the book of Romans. Paul's masterpiece of the New Testament of the book of Romans and uh, I love the book of Romans, and it's rich, it's deep, and it's fantastic. And always keep in mind that the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans deals with salvation and justification, sanctification, sin, and uh, a right relationship with God and how to have that relationship uh, with the Lord Jesus. And Paul deals heavily with that. That's why when he comes out and starts chapter 12, because of that relationship that you and I can have with God through Jesus Christ and justification and sanctification and salvation, he says, I beg you, I plead with you to present your bodies a living sacrifice. And that's why he comes back and says that, and that we ought to do that because of what God did for us in the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. And then he begs us, he pleads with us to present our bodies unto the Lord as a present, as a gift, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. And how do we do that? By the renewing of our mind uh, through the generation of regeneration of the Holy Spirit that we may be able to prove what is that good and acceptable will of God. And then he comes back in beginning in chapter 13 through the rest of the book, Romans 13, 14, 15, and 16, and he deals with our relationship one with another. Because you see, we got to get the first one right before we can get the second one. And so that's what he deals with. And so we're looking at Romans chapter 14 tonight. I'll draw your attention to Romans 14. And then you might want to open up to Ephesians chapter 4 Put a marker in there because we'll be in Ephesians chapter 4 a little bit later on in the message. But right now, we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 14, beginning in verse number 16 through 23. Verses 16 through 23 on edify one another, building one another up, encouraging one another. And boy, do we need that in the time and day in which we're living. I can assure you of that, of, uh, especially of uh, a lot of what our folks are going through. And, uh, you know, some of you don't, uh, uh, are, don't uh, see it as much or realize it as much because you're not as close to it or involved with it. And so you don't see that. And, but then those of us that are, you can see the, just uh, the, the pain, the suffering, and, and all that they're going through. And they need a little bit of building up, a little bit of encouraging and strengthening. And God expects you and I uh, to do that for each other. And so that's important that we do that and work on that. So let me draw your attention to beginning in verse number 16 of Romans chapter 14. Everybody there, and let me thank all of you that are with us tonight, watching with us on Rumble Live. God bless you. Thanks for tuning in. You can look at the link there, and you can print out the study guide or follow along with us. Actually, it'll be up on your screen. You don't have to print it out. You can work on it however you want to. And also, Facebook is with us tonight as well. So God bless you, and thanks for tuning in with us. And we appreciate you letting us come into your home tonight to study the Word of God uh, with us together. So uh, get your Bibles open. Your pens, your pads, as we study the book of Romans tonight. Romans chapter 14, verses 16 through 23. Let's begin reading. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now notice where that righteousness and peace and joy comes from. It's in, that little preposition, very important little preposition there. It's in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things, what the things we just talked about, if righteousness and peace and joy that you have in the Holy Ghost, if you're in these things, you serve Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Everybody got that? All right. Let us therefore... Now, see, here's the therefore, here's the because of. Because of the fact that you are in righteousness, peace, and joy, 
and you have that in the Holy Ghost, and since you have those things, you're serving Christ, which is acceptable to God and approved of men. Okay, that's what he says. Let us then therefore follow after what? These things which make for peace. What are we to follow after? Righteousness, peace, and joy uh, for these things, for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. That's how we're going to edify one another. For meat destroyeth not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth. In other words, see, we don't want to do anything that's going to cause a brother or sister to stumble. See, and, and even, if, even if some of those things are right and okay for us to do, but we have weaker brothers and sisters in Christ, and so we want to be willing to put those aside so that we don't cause the weaker brother and sister to stumble. Okay, so we need to keep that thought in mind. He said, whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. He says, has thou faith? There's a question. He asks, do you have faith? Have it to thyself before God. What are you to do? You're to have faith before God. Okay, happy or blessed is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Okay, so edification is something that every one of us needs in our lives. We need to be built up. We need to be encouraged. And since what he's talking about, we just got through talking about faith, that's one of the things that we need to be built up in and encouraged in is in faith. Okay, we need to do that. Or growth in your life and in my life. Okay, so we're going to take a look at that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for again for tonight. Thank you for your word that we've just read, and it is the word of God, and we thank you for it. Now we ask your blessed Holy Spirit to come and be our teacher and our guide as he will guide us into all truth. And he will speak the truth to us. We ask that he would give us illumination, understanding of that which we uh, get tonight and receive tonight. And then give us wisdom to apply it uh, to our lives that we would all learn to edify one another, build one another one another up, encourage one another uh, in the faith and in the growth in our Christian life. And so, Lord, we thank you for what we've read and, and already and what we've heard already. Now, yes, you would bless our time in your word. May your Holy Spirit uh, come now to your servant that you would anoint his heart, minds, and lips. Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, I think first of all, if we go back and look at verse 19, let's read it again. Let us therefore follow after, what church? These things which make for peace. So there, and then that leads us to what? That we will to edify one another. So I want you to see the passion of edification. The passion of edification. The passion is to live peaceably. That's what he's talking about here. That which make for peace. So the passion for edification is to live peaceably or to follow or to run after peace. So in other words, we're to live peaceably. Notice what he says. These things which make for peace. So we want to live for things that are going to make peace. And the scripture tells us in other places that we ought to live peaceably with all men if possible. Okay, and so, and we can if we will work at it. So that there's the passion of edification. You've got to have a passion for edification. And that's to live peaceably. Not to be warmongers, but to be peacemakers. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers. Okay, so that's what we want to seek to do and to follow after peace. Matter of fact, there's enough war and fighting going on already. I understand that this week alone, was it the other day, last night or yesterday, that Israel launched an attack out on Damascus? And, and so, I mean, you know, there, there's no peace there in the Middle East. And there's no peace in America right now. I'm telling you, there's no peace. And so what's Paul telling us? Man, we need to work towards that. Uh, we need to endeavor to work towards making peace and, 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 and pursuing after peace and, and to, uh, to live peaceably and to follow it and to run after it and to live peaceably. Which things make for peace? What makes for peace? Righteousness, joy, and what was the other one? 
Somebody tell me. Peace, righteousness, peace, and joy. So let's take a look at here. I gave you some things to look at here. How to seek peace, all right? How to seek peace. Well, let's look at verse number seven now. I'm going to back up a little bit here in our chapter. And first of all, to how to seek peace is to stop living for self. Stop living for self. Look what verse 7 says. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. So in other words, we've got to watch out for what we do. We need to stop living for self. And then we need to realize that the gospel should be our focus. Look at verse 9. For to this end, see now we're coming to the end here, Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. So you see, we need to realize that the gospel is our focus. And see, if we will focus on that, then we're not living for self and we're going to be seeking peace. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 1. Now look at verse 10 with me. As he's following up and coming down these verses, if you were to go back and read them, he comes to this conjunction in verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. In other words, you see, leave the judgment up to God. See, that's where all things will get settled at the judgment seat of Christ. All things are going to be settled at the judgment seat of Christ. So that's why we need to stop living for self. We need to realize and focus on the gospel and realize that all things are going to be settled at the judgment seat of Christ. Then Paul mentioned there in the passage we were reading in verses 13 and 15. Take a look at it again. You have it in your notes or your scripture. We need to avoid causing others to stumble. Okay, we're taught how to seek peace. Avoid causing others to stumble. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore. But rather, uh, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and I am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. This is what Paul's saying. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So, but if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy not him with thy meat, uh, for whom Christ died. In other words, don't judge that weaker brother. You see, none of us have arrived. See, we're not going to uh, keep peace if we're causing everyone to stumble. 1 Corinthians 8, 8 and 9. But meat condemneth us not to God, for neither. If we eat, are, are we the better? Are we the better? Neither if we eat not, are we the worse? But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Now we're always going to have the weaker brothers and sisters around us. Not everybody's on the same plane spiritually. Not everybody grows at the same level and at the same speed. And so you see, the whole thing here is, you know, we got to edify one another. We need to build one another up uh, in the faith and, and in their Christian growth and in, in their life, especially to the weaker ones. And by all means, we don't want to get in a battle with them and have a war with them. We want to keep and maintain the peace, and we don't want to cause them to stumble. And so that's what he's trying to help us with here. Dr. Warren Wiersbe said this, There's one thing we should judge. We should judge ourselves to see whether uh, we are abusing our Christian liberty and making others stumble. Certainly nothing is unclean of itself, but some practices and habits are considered unclean by others. Therefore, if we deliberately do something that makes our brothers stumble, then we're not living according to the rule of love. So I think it will help us a little bit on how to seek for peace in this. Look at verse 19 with me, a little bit here now. Verse 19 there. All right, what's he say? Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace. Okay, so in other words, we're going to have to build strongly. And the things wherewith one may edify one another. Isn't that what he said? Follow after peace and the things wherewith one may edify one another. So we've got to build one another up strongly. Amen. Not weakly, but strongly. 
as we pursue this to seek peace, to have the passion of edification, to live peacefully. That's the first thing he mentioned there that we talk about this thing of peace. So then now let's take a look at the priority of, ed- uh, of edification. The priority of edification. I think we see that here in verse number 21. Take a look with me down there in the scripture and look at it. It says, it is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine uh, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. In other words, simply don't do anything that's going to cause a brother or sister to stumble. I mean, about, about as simple as you can get. So the priority of education is to the priority in your life and my life. We ought to live without an offense uh, uh, you see, uh, and with faith. See, we ought to live with faith and not with offenses. Amen. You see. So the priority of education, live without an offense. The goal under grace is not to do what we may be free to do, but rather what will not cause others offense, offense to others. So we need to be careful. Live without offenses, you see, in this endeavor to build one another up and to encourage one another, and to strengthen one another in the faith, and to build their faith, and to, to edify them, and to build them up, and to build them up strongly in the faith, and, and to help the weaker ones along, and encourage the weaker ones along, and especially, church, in, in the times what we're going through right now. Man, people are hurting, and people need some encouragement. Amen. I mean, they, they really do. We, we saw that in, in, in the lives of some of the people th- this past week uh, there in the hospital and visiting. You know, you're, you're there one time with them and they're down and, and they're discouraged and, and, you know, there's like almost giving up hope and things don't seem like they're going to get any better and uh, this, this is all there is to it and, you know, is there going to be any improvement? But, but you go in there and you begin to talk with them and you begin to laugh with them and you begin to get them to smile and you begin to cheer them up and have some fun and, 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 and smiles come across their face and fun and then they begin to respond back and begin to joke and, and have a little fun with you and you begin to just uh, you know, give them some encouragement that hey, this is not the end, it's not over. You know, God's in control, God's will's gonna be done, God's gonna handle this, you know, we're gonna get through this and we reminded of them this is just a test. And we're going to be overcomers, and we're going to overcome this test. And you know, and, and the next thing you know, their whole attitude changed, and they're smiling on their faces, and they're encouraged, and like, you know, okay, man, let's go, let's go. I mean, they're, they're ready to go for it. And we saw that in, in, in Armin, and uh, Eldor was there with us, and, and uh, Alan was with us, and we saw that in Jean. Uh, matter of fact, with Jean, she, uh, Sharon was there with us with Jean, and, 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 and even uh, Jean said, man, this is the first time I, I think I've smiled and laughed in a long time. You know, and, 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 and so was Sharon, and we were just kind of joking at first with her, and, and she kind of didn't take a, she was a little bit, uh, you know, she doesn't know me, never met me, so she was, you know, but then when, once she kind of got in there, she said, man, she started laughing and, and cutting up and having a good time, and just began to just, uh, like, you know, we're going to get through this thing. And, uh, you know, she had a bad infection in her stomach and in the lining of her stomach here. And they found it with the ultrasound uh, that morning, matter of fact, before we got there. And they, they came in there right there in the room and, uh, and, and opened her up and, and, and squeezed that thing out and probed. And she's telling us all about it. And, and Sharon's over there going, ooh, and it was gross. And, you know, Sharon saw this, but yet, you know, uh, and we, were, we were having a good time. The next thing you know, she's laughing and smiling and, and uh, she's ready to go and feeling like she's going to get to go home. And then she improved the next day and, and it got better the next day. We went and saw her again. And just each time we went, she's just doing better and better. She's home. You know, so, you know, you, you got you to gotta encourage people and you got to lift them up and, and build them up and, and uh, you know, and, uh, and strengthen them. And we talked about the Lord and she talked about the Lord. And, and you know, and, uh, we talked about the rapture. Armin was ready to go by the time we left the room. I mean, he, he, he said, let's go, man. I'm ready. Let's go. Uh, he said, it, it wasn't it, what's it say? It's something about we're going to get out of here in a twinkling of an eye or something like that. And I said, yeah, you guys in here, you and Alan and Eldor, you can go in the twinkling of an eye. I'll be dragged behind a little bit because I'm going to be in a chariot of fire. And, and Armin says, well, you can go in a chariot of fire, but I'm going in a twinkling of an eye. And he said he was ready for the rapture. And just prior to that, he was ready to almost give up. You know, just, you know, is there any, any going to be any 
relief of this? Is there going to be any, uh, anything better to life than this? I mean, is, is this it? I mean, are we going to, because at this point, uh, they hadn't discovered much of anything, and what's wrong? And then finally they found something, said, this is what we got to do. And, and so the, the, this was the deal. We're going to uh, do surgery, and it's, it's set for this one. Then they canceled it, and then said again, canceled. And then it's tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, and I get a call at 7.30 a.m. in the morning. Ms. Eldor says, they've already done it. And what? They came during the night and took him. Now, let me tell you something. And I started to say, okay, Miss Eldor, she was, she was upset. Rightfully so. I mean, she goes down the walks down the hallway, going into the room to see her husband, and he's not there. And we knew the condition he was in. I mean, he was in a, a, a life, uh, you know, hanging on there. And all of a sudden, she turns the corner, and he's not there. He's gone. And, and certainly the first thing in her, her heart and her mind was, he's passed away. And, and they haven't called me and told me. And then she said, oh, oh we, they came during the night and took him and did the surgery. Never called her or the family and let them know. No word whatsoever. So you can imagine, you know, so I said, okay, just hang in there. He's next door, right? Okay, well, let's praise God he's alive. Let's praise God he got through the surgery. He's still with us. We didn't lose him. Uh, he's in 4106. He's in the surgery wing. Just hang loose. I'll, I'll get ready. I'll be on my way. And, uh, you know, we just I wanted to go and just be a, a comfort and encouragement to her because of everything that was going on. And, and I was getting ready to go and, uh, and leave. And she calls me back. And she said, you can't come. I said, what do you mean? She said, they won't let you up here. And so the, no, no pastors were allowed on the fourth floor because of COVID. And so we just pray God move him out of there and go move him tomorrow. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, you know, you, you got to, so she's gone through a lot. And, and I saw Sharon and, and Darlene, and we visited with Sharon when we were there with Jean, and we visited with Darlene while she was there with Jean. And, you know, the, these gals have gone through an awful lot, and, and we had a little fun there with Sharon. And Sharon, you can see, was just wiped out, and her sister, and this infection, and all that they did. And so I just said, well, I said, told uh, Sharon, uh, Jean, I said, now, Jean, when we have a little opportunity here, you know, we come back, and it'll be just maybe us here in the room where we can fellowship with a little bit and talk. And I said, I got some really stories I want to tell you. And, 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 and Sharon said, no, 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 don't you dare, don't you dare. I said, oh, yes, I've got to, I've got to. And Jean says, that's okay, Pastor, because i got a lot to tell you, too. And, and, and Sharon says, oh, no. And, I mean, she, she was all down from the, from the surgery procedure she saw. And she started laughing. And, you know, we just, we just had a good time. And, you know, we welcomed, welcomed, welcomed Jean to uh, having a nice vacation here in sunny Florida. And, and she said, where are you coming from? I said, well, right here. I mean, you know, and then just, you just think you're getting to stay here in the University of Florida Hilton. And she said, man, this is no Hilton. I mean, you know, so you get, you put a smile on their face, folks. Cheer them up a little bit. And, you know, this thing's going to be okay. We're going to get through this thing. And, uh, you know, have the privilege to, to lay hands on them and to pray for them and, and to see God begin to move and recover as we laid hands on the arm and prayed for him. And it's like right after that, things begin to turn around, not just us, but the, the prayers of all the saints that have been praying put to, together collectively. And, and the laying on of hands was just kind of like putting icing on the cake, you might say. You see, but it was all the prayers of the saints, and, and boy, things begin to turn around, and the guy, they're getting ready to move him out of the recovery room, and they say he's doing really great, and he's improving. I mean, see, folks, that's all uh, an answer to God's prayer, okay? You see, a combination of it, and Jean's gone home today, another answer of God's prayer, and she turned around that day after the laying on of hands, and all of your prayers together, and so this is what it's about, uh, you know, uh, ministering to others, building them up, strengthening them in the faith, encouraging them in the faith. And so we praise God for that. So let's try to live without offenses as we put a, a priority in our lives uh, to, to, to edify and to build one another up, to lift one another up, to courage, encourage one another up. Because, man, we get beat up and beat up enough as it is from the world and the devil and everybody else out there wants to beat the daylights out of us and kick us, to down, to kick us down when we're down. And so, man, we just need to turn this thing around. That's why Titus chapter 2, I love this, says 11 and 12, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Can somebody say Amen. You see, that's, that's how you got that salvation. You understand that? And what does it do? It teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. 
See, and if you're living that way, you're not going to live a life of an offense. You're not going to be offending folks if you're living in that type of life. And then he mentioned in verse 22, take a look at it there with us. Hast thou faith? He asked the question. So in other words, since he's talking about making it a priority, live without offense and live with faith. And he says there to live with faith, notice, before God. Are you with me on that? See it in verse 22? So we want to live with faith before God, and we want to live with faith that does not condemn. Amen. See, because he talked about judging. See, we're not to condemn. And by the way, let me read a wonderful verse for you while we're here in Romans. One of my favorite ones that I love, and I like to quote to myself over and over all, the, all, to, all over the time. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore... Now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. A believer is not condemned. Why? Because he is in Christ. So you see, that's why we want to live without an offense. That's why we want to live with faith before God. And that's why we want to live with faith that does not condemn because you see, how can you condemn a brother and sister in Christ when Paul, I just read to you in eight ones, says if that brother and sister is in Christ, they're under no condemnation. First Corinthians eight seven. How be it, there is not in every man that knowledge. Not every man has that knowledge. Paul says, for some with conscience uh, of the idol unto this hour eat uh, it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Even though that they are, you see, we're to live by faith before God, and we're to live by, with, with faith that does not condemn them. Judge them. Christ will take care of that. And then especially in the life of believer, well, we're gonna, that's all going to be settled at the judgment seat of Christ. That's coming. Do you know that's where you're going? Now, you might get out of here in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, or you might get to hitch a ride on my chariot, but Elisha's going to be driving it. I think he'd have a fun time to do it a second time. He'd probably tell the Lord and say, man, that was so good. Let's do it again. And since I've got experience with this, you know, and that boy doesn't, let me go help him. Amen. And so we praise God for that. I mean, just, uh, you know, and guess where we're going? To the Bema seat. The judgment seat of Christ. And so, you see, we need to keep that thought in mind. So, we, we looked at the passion of edification. Live peaceably. Do what you can to seek peace. Avoid causing uh, to be a stumbling block to others. Build one another strongly in the faith. And then, then make that, that edification a priority in your life, you see, uh, to, to live without that offense and to live with faith before God and to live with faith not to condemn one another. Amen. You know, the world condemns us enough as it is. The devil condemns us all the time, you know, and so we don't need to go around doing it. All right, so let's look at the perfection of edification, the perfection of edification, and that, I believe, is through the process of hearing and doing the Word. Amen. It is going to be through the process of hearing and doing the Word. Now get over to Ephesians where we were at and where I told you earlier, and we're going to take a look at Ephesians and finish up here in Ephesians chapter 4, looking at verses 11 through 13. Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 13, Paul's letter to the church of Ephesus, to the believers there, and uh, young uh, Timothy is probably pastoring there at this time, and so we take a look at this as the perfection of so there's the passion of edification, okay? There's the priority of edification. Let's take a look now at the perfection of edification. And that's going to be through the process of hearing and doing the Word. Amen. Remember what Brother James told us over in James? He said, not to be hearers only, but to be doers. Amen. See, you can hear, but you need to do what you hear. Yeah. Okay? So let's take a look at it here. In Ephesians chapter 4, let's begin reading in verse number 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now these were gifted men that God has given to the church. Now, now we know that the apostles are gone. There are no apostles. 
There were only 12. One was a traitor. Matthias took his place. Then he kind of disappeared off the scene in the Apostle Paul. That's it. There were no more apostles than those guys. There are no other apostles mentioned in the Scripture. No other names, no other teaching about apostles in the Scripture after them. You know why? Because there are none. All these guys going around calling themselves apostles, well, I don't find their name in here. I don't see the Scripture writing about them and talking about them. And, and I would like to know how they can be an apostle because one of the main things to be an apostle, they had to be an eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I don't think any of these modern days apostles have seen Jesus. Well, maybe some have, the way they talk and act. They claim now that they're messiahs and their blood is mixed with Jesus' blood and all this stuff. Oh my goodness. No more apostles, folks. There are no more prophets. John the Baptist was the last Old Testament prophet, and we don't find any more prophets mentioned after that. Okay? So those are gone. So what do we still have left for gifted men in the church today? We have evangelists. There are still gifted men that are given to the church. Okay, we have pastors, gifted men to the church. We have teachers, gifted men given to the church. And so what are these three gifted for? What are these men gifted for to the church for? For the perfecting, the maturing, the completing of the saints. For what? For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. And when is this to be done? Till we all come in unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, a mature man, a complete man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. So you see, this thing of edification has to do with the perfection of the believer, of maturing the believer in his faith and his walk with Christ as we started out in the beginning, you see. Live to where we want to help one another to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord, to build them up, to encourage them, to bring them to a place of perfection, of completeness, but bring them to a place of maturity in their Christian life. And folks, let me tell you something. It's a lifelong process. That's why I said in the beginning, through the process of hearing and doing the Word of God, and we're going to do that until we all come into the fullness of Christ. And we're not there yet, but we're coming. We're getting there. See, we don't know everything right now. Paul said that. He says, right now we only know in part. But there'll come a time when we will know everything when we see him face to face. I haven't seen him face to face, but it's coming. Looking forward to it. So what's the first person there he gave it? Let's say, so he gives us teachers. Verse 11, he gives us teachers of edification. Teachers are to build up. Teachers are to encourage. Teachers are to, to, to mature uh, the believer in their walk, in their faith with Christ, and to build them up and to, edu- and to help uh, mature them and help complete them and help to edify them and encourage them. That's why we got teachers. It's important. Acts 20, 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed the church of God which he had purchased with his own blood. You see, we're to take heed to that. Strong warning. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So we have teachers that God has given to the church for what? For the purpose of edification, of building you up, strengthening you in the faith, encouraging you in the faith, in your walk with Christ. And how do we do that? Through the Word. Through the teaching of the Word. Now you've got to do more than just hear it. You've got to obey it. You see, that's why James says, if all you do is hear it, he said, you're deceived. And you deceive yourself. But if you do it, you're blessed. So I don't know about you. I want to be blessed. Amen? All right? Then notice verse 12 here in, in our work in Ephesians here. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, 
for the edifying of the body of Christ. In other words, you see, this perfection of edification is the teachers of edification, but then there is the testimony of edification. And what is the testimony of edification? Perfecting. Perfecting. The definition of perfecting means to complete furnishing or equipping. You see, that's what we're doing. We're, we're, the testimony of edification is to perfecting of the saints, equipping the saints to do what? To do the work of the ministry. Amen. So you see, edification is very important in the life and our relationship with one another and the relationship with the church. And how important it is as we, we work together and, and, and to accomplish the things that God has for us. 1 Thessalonians 3.10 night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. You see, Paul writes to the church of Thessalonica and says, listen, man, we, we're praying for you night and day. We want to see your face that we may complete, that we may mature uh, you where you're lacking in your faith. You may say, well, there's the weak ones. And so we got to come along and strengthen them. we got to come along and build them up in the faith. we got to encourage them in the faith, especially when they're down in the dumps. Now, your day will come, too, down in the dumps. Guarantee it, it will. And you're going to need someone to come along and encourage you and to build you up and to strengthen you. And I'll tell you, when you're down in the dumps like, like poor Brother Armin's been for a week and, and Sister uh, Jean has been for uh, two months now, I want to tell you something. Your faith starts to dwindle a little bit. I mean, because they're human, and you're going to be human. And you're wondering, God, what's going on? Why is all this happening to me? I don't understand this. How's come out to, you know, uh, another test, another trial? Uh, it doesn't seem like anything's happening. I mean, two months I've been put, fighting this in, in, in the hospital. And I'm telling you what, it, it drags on you. It pulls you down. It, it, it drains you emotionally and physically and spiritually. It drains you out of your body. And you need some brother and sister and saint to come along and lift them up. And to encourage them. To strengthen them. In the faith. Your trust and faith in God. He hasn't deserted you dear sister. He said he would never leave you Gene. He'd never forsake you Gene. He said he would walk with you through the valley of death Gene. He said he would never leave you. He said he would stick closer to you than a brother. He said I've not seen you forsaken. Uh, he said I will never forsake you. See those are the things you take the word of God. And you minister them the word of God. And that begins to get their focus on Christ. And focused on the word of God. And it's through the word of God that you build them up. That's how you do it. And you know what? Smiles come on their face. They get happy. They start talking about the Lord. They start talking about going home in the rapture. I mean, just get, that's our blessed hope. Amen. Armin was faced with a pretty, pretty heavy decision. You know, because of the fact that he had pneumonia. It's in the lungs. He has COPD pretty bad. Amen. And now you're going to have an anesthesiologist put you out for a few hours. That's not a good thing. That's a risk. That's a high risk. I don't know what the percentage is, but that way I, would, I was putting him at 70-30. You know, and most surgeons won't even do it. But he came to the conclusion. He says, hey, it doesn't matter. I'm saved one way or another. I'll either go during the surgery or I'll go in glory one or the other. But let's go with it. Let's do it. And so we were able to encourage him and strengthen him. And so was everybody else and Mrs. Eldor and so forth. And just pray until we're ready to go. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. All right, number two here. We've got to hurry and wrap this up, all right? What are we talking about tonight? We're talking about the perfection of edification. How do we do that? How do we mature McCleet? We do it through godly teachers teaching us the Word of God. And the testimony of that is what? Perfecting the saints. Maturing the saints. Completing them you know, in their Christian walk in life with the Lord. All right, we read Thessalonians there, and, and we looked at that. Number two, working. The testimony of edification is perfecting, but it's also working. Look at verse 12 with me. Everybody in verse 12? Okay, uh, uh, where are we at in Ephesians chapter 4 here, verse 12? Yeah, I'm going to get back over here, verse 12. There we go. For the perfecting of the saints. Okay, there's the, there's the testimony of edification for perfecting. Now, here's the next one. Here's the working for the work of the ministry. Amen. Folks, the ministry takes work and lots of it. 
And it doesn't get done by just one or two people. It takes a lot of people, believe it or not. Even in a small church, it takes a lot of people to make it all work and to make it happen and to come together. Especially if a church wants to do and wants to have and, and wants to meet three and four times a week and wants to have all. That takes people that are dedicated, committed, faithful, loyal. Uh, or Otherwise, it's not going to get done. And, and that's the work of the ministry. So working, ministry, spiritual service. Then notice what else he said there in verse 12. He mentioned a third one. He said edifying. Everybody see that? The perfecting of the saints, there's the testimony, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Edifying means to be building up a house, building upon a foundation, and Christ is the foundation. And so we want to build in this, in this testimony. It looks at what 1 Corinthians 14, 12, the Bible tells us, Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, Seek that ye may excel, look at this, to the edifying of the church. Now there are all kinds of spiritual gifts, and Paul says here is that we ought to seek to excel, not in all the other gifts, but to excel in this gift of edifying. That's why he said, man, you, you can prophesy and do all this stuff, but if you have love, you got nothing. And he said, if you're going to seek these gifts, seek the gift of prophesying so that you can prophesy the Word of God. It's the Word of God through the gospel and the preaching of Christ that men and women are going to get saved, not through some of the showy, signy gifts. But here he tells me, man, you need to excel, to seek to excel to the edifying of the church. We'd have to ask us all a question tonight. How excelling are you doing? You see, how excelling are you doing and, and to seeking to edify the body of Christ, which is the church? Not only are we the body of Christ, we are the bride of Christ. He's the groom. We're engaged. We're betrothed to the groom. But not only are we the body of Christ, not only are we the, the bride of Christ, but the Bible tells me that we are sons and daughters of God. Boy, we're in a tight-knit family here, brother. Amen? Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of, talk to me, edifying. What is edifying? Building up. Encouraging that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And then lastly, he says one more thing there in verse 13. Look what he says in verse 13. Till we all come in the, talk to me, the unity of faith. The definition of unity is oneness, agreement. We got to all come into agreement and in oneness in this thing. So you can see how important edifying is one to another. You see, and we've got brothers and sisters now just because they're home we don't stop edifying. We don't stop building up. We don't stop encouraging. Now that they're home, uh, Jean's home, you can go there and see her. You can call her and talk to her. Armin's going to be home before long, amen, because he's just going to keep improving. He's going to get out of the surgery room tomorrow. We're going to get him in a normal room where some of us can go and see him again on Thursday or Friday or Saturday, and then hopefully by the first of the week sometime, and he gets going, and they get to training him and everything that's going on, and we're still not sure whether it's going to be a permanent or a temporary thing. Right, Miss Eldor? Not sure on that yet. What is it? You're sure not you're sure yet, okay? And so we're just seeing what God's going to have in store for that. But you know what? I want to tell you something. Let me tell you something. That, that, that's going to, uh, again, there's going to be need some time of encouraging. There's going to be some time of building up and encouraging. Because you see, his life's about to be altered. Just like Gene's life has been altered. And hers is not over because hers is temporary so far. Which means in another six months, she's going back in and have to start this all over again. And Armin, whether his is temporary or permanent, 
And so that's why you see, it's not over. What I tell, what I tell, what was it? When I say it's not over until Armin sings, so I was talking to you, David Seldor, or you, Jerry, wasn't over until Liz sings. It's not over until, until, until Liz sings. It's not over until Armin sings. It's not over until Jean sings. But yet by, by, by the time we had a wonderful visit with her, so you know what the first thing she said to us? She says, as soon as I can get out of here, as soon as I can get home and doing better, I am going to be in church. And I want to publicly thank the church for everybody that prayed for me. You see, this is what it's about. And I know Armin will do the same thing. Don't have any problem with him. But, you know, this is a person, you know, the first time we met and everything. And she wanted to let all of you know she is so grateful and thankful for all of your prayers and praying for her. And she says she has felt them. And there was times when she was very low in her life. But she felt the presence of God through the prayers of the saints. So we don't stop. We don't stop building up. We don't stop encouraging. There's others here sitting around us. The wounded duck, I mean wounded uh, nightingale over here. What she's gone through with her sol- shoulder. Do you mind if I share anything on that? You know, she's 78, 79 now. 78 been a widow for nine years right nine eleven years going on eleven wow time's flied since we said goodbye to Roger wow they're going to go in and clean her shoulder all out they're going to remove the block and sew her back up and the surgeon told her that her right arm will become useless it's just going to hang on her body like a piece of spaghetti a limp a limp limb you can do nothing with it now I'm telling you that's a sister that's going to need encouraging and built up and loved to what she's facing it's another test sister but you're an overcomer because you've overcome everything that's been thrown at you since I've known you and we're going to be here for you. See, we have no idea. And to have to face all this alone, to face all this at, up in the age, you know, they need edifying, encouraged, building up. in the days ahead. Armin will need too. He's not through this. Jane will need it too. And there's others. Daniel and his foot. Liz and her nose. Sandy and her tummy. Oh, I like that. Sandy and her tummy. Amen. That's pretty good. We'll write a song about Sandy and her tummy. Amen. And then Eldora's going through this with him. She needs encouraged and lifted up and edified. Darlene and Sharon have been going through this for two months. And I mean, you can just see it in their faces. They need encouraging and edifying and built up. And many others amongst us, what they're going through. And so let's Become edifiers, builder uppers, encouragers, strengtheners in the days ahead to everyone as we face the trials and tests that come our way. And we too can become overcomers until Jesus comes in the clouds of glory. And then we can all sing. Amen. 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 Father, we thank you. We praise you. Now, Lord, we've heard your word tonight. We thank you for it. Now help us to apply it. Help us to put it to practice in our lives, what we've learned tonight on edifying 
one another because every one of us needs it sometime or another. Matter of fact, we need it most of the time. So, Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We thank you that the Holy Spirit comes alongside of us and he encourages us, amen, and builds us up and lifts us up and, and uh, shares the word with us in our hearts, and comforts us, tells us that it won't be long. Jesus is coming in the clouds of glory and we shall see him face to face. Oh, that will be glory for me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey.